Uh, this is Langston Hughes. Many of my poems are poems about the Negro people in relation to American democracy and about the problems of American democracy in general as applied to race. The um, first poem is called Afro-American Fragment. So long, so far away is Africa. Not even memories alive, save those that history books create, save those that songs beat back into the blood, beat out of blood with words sad sung in strange, un-Negro tongue. So long, so far away is Africa. Subdued and time lost are the drums, and yet through some vast mist of race there comes this song I do not understand, this song of atavistic land, of bitter yearnings lost without a place. So long, so far away is Africa's dark face. This is The Negro Speaks of Rivers, one of my earliest poems written in 1920, just after I came out of high school. The way this poem came to be written was that I was going to Mexico to visit my father who lived in Mexico City, and on the train going across the Mississippi River, just outside St. Louis, I looked out the window and I saw this great muddy river flowing down toward the heart of the south, and I began to think about what this river meant to the Negro people, how, in a sense, our history was linked to this river, how in slavery time, my grandmother had told me that to be sold down the Mississippi was one of the worst things that could happen to a Negro slave. And then uh, I remembered that I'd read about Abraham Lincoln going down the Mississippi as a young man, and he went on a raft to New Orleans, and he saw human beings bought and sold in the slave market there, and he was so horrified by this that he never forgot it. And many years later, of course, we know that it was Lincoln who signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And so uh, as the train went on into the gathering dusk, because it had been about sunset when we crossed the river, I took my father's letter out of my pocket and began to write down on the back of his letter this poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. This one is a poem almost as old as The Negro Speaks of Rivers. It was written when I was perhaps 21. It's called Negro. I'm a Negro, black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. I've been a slave. Caesar told me to keep his doorsteps clean. I brushed the boots of Washington. I've been a worker. Under my hand, the pyramids arose. I made mortar for the Woolworth building. I've been a singer. All the way from Africa to Georgia, I carried my sorrow songs. I made ragtime. I've been a victim. The Belgians cut off my hands in the Congo. They lynch me now in Mississippi. I am a Negro, black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. American Heartbreak. I am the American heartbreak, rock on which freedom stumps its toe, the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago. Dream Variations. This poem, like the first one that I read, uh, has overtones of Africa. 
to fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done, then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently, dark like me. That is my dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done. Rest at pale evening, a tall, slim tree, night coming tenderly, black like me. When I was a child in Lawrence, Kansas, the town where I lived until I was about 13 years old, we used to attend a little church, uh, and in this church, it was a Methodist church, by the way, um, I used to hear some of the old spirituals sung on Sunday mornings by the congregation. And at that time, I didn't know that I was going to be a writer. I didn't uh, have any idea that these songs would someday influence my own creative uh, sensibilities. But years later, when I began to consciously write in the folk forms of the Negro people, I wrote a series of poems uh, included in the, this book of mine under the title Feet of Jesus, a series of poems in which you can quite clearly see the influence of the Negro spirituals. Uh, this one is called Feet of Jesus, the poem that gives the title to the entire section, and it's so short I think you might almost call it the breath of a spiritual. It goes like this. At the feet of Jesus, sorrow like a sea, Lordy, let your mercy come drifting down on me. At the feet of Jesus, at your feet I stand. Oh, my precious Jesus, please reach out your hand. Another very short poem in this genre is prayer. I ask you this, which way to go? I ask you this, which sin to bear? Which crown to put upon my hair? I do not know, Lord God, I do not know. Here's a poem about a sinner who is a little bit afraid about what might happen on Judgment Day, and so this is what he says. Fire, fire, Lord, fire gonna burn my soul. I ain't been good, I ain't been clean. I'm an evil, low down, mean. Fire, fire, Lord, fire gonna burn my soul. Tell me, brother, do you believe if you want to go to heaven, got to moan and grieve? Fire. Fire, Lord, fire gonna burn my soul. I've been stealing, been telling lies, had more women than Pharaoh had wives. Fire, fire, Lord, fire gonna burn my soul. I mean fire, Lord, fire gonna burn my soul. And then, one who is not afraid of Judgment Day might say something like this in a poem that is called Judgment Day. They put my body in the ground, my soul went flying over the town, went flying to the stars and moon, a shouting God, I's coming soon, oh Jesus. Lord in heaven, crown on his head, says don't be afraid, cause you ain't dead, kind Jesus. And now I'm setting clean and bright in the sweet of my Lord's sight, clean and bright, clean and bright. For a time in my childhood, I lived in Kansas City. And Kansas City, as almost everybody knows, is one of the centers of American jazz. Uh, from Kansas City have come such fine jazz musicians as Mary Lou Williams and Count Basie and, oh, quite a number of others. At any rate, uh, when I was a kid in Kansas City, very often I used to hear the blues. There were blind guitar players who would sing the blues on street corners. There were uh, people plunking the blues on beat-up old pianos. That was, of course, before the days of the jukebox and the radio. And in those days, uh, 
almost everybody who could afford to have a piano had one and, and played them in their homes. And so you heard a lot of live music. Well, at any rate, I was very much um, attracted to the blues, and I remember even now some of the blues verses that I used to hear as a child in Kansas City. And so uh, I, in my early beginnings at poetry writing, uh, tried to weave the blues into my poetry. One of the poems that I wrote in Harlem in the 1920s is a poem called The Weary Blues. Droning a drowsy, syncopated tune, rocking back and forth to a mellow croon, I heard a Negro play. Down on Lenox Avenue the other night, by the pale, dull pallor of an old gas light, he did a lazy sway, he did a lazy sway to the tune of those weary blues. With his ebony hands on each ivory key, he made that poor piano moan with melody, oh, blues. Swaying to and fro on his rickety stool, he played that sad, raggy tune like a musical fool. Sweet blues, coming from a black man's soul, oh, blues. In a deep song voice with a melancholy tone, I heard that Negro sing, that old piano moan. Ain't got nobody in all this world. Ain't got nobody but myself. I was going to quit my frowning and put my troubles on the shelf. Thump, 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 went each foot on the floor. Played a few chords, then he sang some more. I got the weary blues and I can't be satisfied. Got the weary blues, can't be satisfied. I ain't happy no more and I wish that I had died. Far into the night he crooned that tune. The stars went out, and so did the moon. The singer stopped playing and went to bed. While the weary blues echoed through his head, he slept like a rock or a man that's dead. Bad morning. Here I sat with my shoes mismated. Lordy mercy, I was frustrated. Could be, could be Hastings Street or Lenox Avenue. Could be 18th and Vine and still be true. Could be 5th and Mound, could be Rampart. When you pawn my watch, you pawn my heart. Could be you love me, could be that you don't. Might be that you'll come back. Like as not, you won't. Hastings Street is weary, also Lenox Avenue. Any place is dreary without my watch and you. Bad luck card. Cause you don't love me is awful, awful hard. Gypsy done showed me my bad luck card. There ain't no good left in this world for me. Gypsy done told me. Unlucky as can be. I don't know what poor weary me can do. Gypsy says, I'd kill myself if I was you. But usually people don't go around killing themselves. And this particular character that I must have had in mind when I was writing these poems uh, certainly didn't kill himself. Uh, in fact, there is a poem about him called Life is fine, and tells about his thoughts on suicide and how they work out. The poem goes like this. I went down to the river. I sat out on the bank. I tried to think but couldn't, so I jumped in and sank. I came up once and hollered. I came up twice and cried. If that water hadn't have been so cold, I might have sunk and died. But it was cold in that water. It was cold. I took the elevator 16 floors above the ground. I thought about my baby and I thought I would jump down. I stood there and I hollered. I stood there and I cried. If it hadn't been so high up there, you know I might have jumped and died. But it was high up there. It was high. So since I'm still here living, I guess I will live on. 
I could have died for love, but for living I was born. Though you may hear me holler and you may see me cry, I'll be dog, sweet baby, if you're going to see me die, because life is fine, fine as wine. Life is fine. Well, um, sometimes in writing the poetry of the blues, I've tried to write in the exact format of the traditional folk blues. The blues have a strict lyric pattern. It's one long line repeated and a third line that rhymes with the first two. And, of course, the blues have a musical pattern, too, usually a 12-bar pattern. The blues also have a unique quality, I think, in that they combine usually both sadness and humor. Almost every traditional blues is about some rather sad situation, and yet somewhere along toward the end of the song, usually the last line of a blues verse, there's a funny little twist that will make people laugh. I've tried to get that quality into my, shall we call them, created blues, because, of course, I consciously write these, and so I guess you can't call them real uh, folk blues, unless you want to say that I'm a folk poet myself, a folk person, which maybe I am. I'll read you one called Bound North Blues. Well, it might be about somebody who has just come out of Mississippi. Going down the road, Lord, going down the road, down the road, Lord, way, way down the road. Got to find somebody to help me carry this load. Roads in front of me, nothing to do but walk. Roads in front of me, walk and walk and walk. I'd like to meet a good friend to come along and talk. Hates to be lonely. Lord, I hates to be sad. Says, I hates to be lonely, hates to be lonely and sad. But every friend you find seems like they try to do you bad. Road, 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 oh, road, 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 road. Road, 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 oh, on the northern road. These Mississippi towns ain't fit for a hopping toad. Well, of course... The rent is usually not having sense. You have to work for it. And that is one reason why I have written so many other things other than poetry. I hope that if I ever get enough, not laurels, but greenbacks to retire from having to make a living from writing, that I will then have time again to write maybe almost nothing but poetry. I worked for a time in a nightclub in Paris, and since that time, I have had a great deal of uh, association with people in the theater and jazz musicians who work in nightclubs. When I worked in a nightclub, I was technically called a second cook, but actually dishwasher at the Grand Duke on the Rue Pigalle in Paris. That was back in the 20s. So I had really no association with the music end of the club, but every night I used to hear this jazz band playing, a very good Negro jazz band from New York, and I began to try to put the syncopated rhythms of jazz into my poetry. And perhaps you might feel those rhythms in some of the poems that I'm going to read at this moment. Um, this is a poem called Midnight Raffle. I put my nickel in the raffle of the night. Somehow that raffle didn't turn out right. I lost my nickel, I lost my time. I got back home without a dime. When I dropped that nickel in the subway slot, I wouldn't have dropped it knowing what I got. I could just as well have stayed home inside. My bread wasn't buttered on neither side. Miss Blues's Child If the blues would let me, Lord knows I would smile. If the blues would let me, I would smile, smile, smile. Instead of that, I'm crying. I must be Miss Blues's child. You were my moon up in the sky, at night my wishing star. I love you, oh, I love you so. 
but you have gone so far. Now my days are lonely, and nighttime drives me wild. In my heart I'm crying. I'm just Miss Blues's child. This one, written during the mid-1940s, it's an attempt to get something of the quality and feeling of bebop music into poetry. The poem is called Dream Boogie. Good morning, Daddy. Ain't you heard the boogie-woogie rumble of a dream deferred? Listen closely. You'll hear their feet beating out and beating out a... You think it's a happy beat? Listen to it closely. Ain't you heard something underneath like a... What did I say? Sure, I'm happy. Take it away. Hey, Pop, Rebop, Mop. Yay. In a more serious vein, and yet at the same time attempting to keep something of the humor of the folk negro, even in the face of a serious situation, I've written this poem called Ku Klux. This particular poem if I remember correctly, was written in Washington. For a time in 1924-25, I lived in Washington. I worked as a busboy at the Warden Park Hotel, and it was there that the great uh, poet Bachel Lindsay came to have lunch in one day, and I saw him in the dining room, and so I quickly wrote out three of my poems on some scrap paper I found around the pantry somewhere, and I put these poems down beside Bachel Lindsay's plate and muttered something about, I like your poetry, and I'm trying to write poetry too, and I went away. I was very shy in those days. I guess still I'm shy in a sense, particularly when it comes to celebrities. Well, uh, I never saw Bachel Lindsay again. He was reading his poems that night in the little theater of the Warden Park Hotel, but at that time in Washington, colored people could not go to the theaters. We couldn't buy tickets to the National or anywhere else. Uh, except theaters in the Negro neighborhoods. And so I couldn't go to hear Rachel Lindsay read his poems, and I didn't know until the next morning uh, what happened at that program. When I got out to the Wardman Park Hotel about 7 o'clock the next morning, going to work, the head waiter said to me, there are some reporters uh, waiting for you in the dining room. And I said, reporters waiting for me? What have I done? And he said, well, I don't know, but they want to interview you. So I got into my busboy uniform and went in the dining room, and sure enough, there were a couple of reporters and a photographer. And they said, you've been discovered. And I said, what? And they said, why don't you know Vetcher Lindsay read your poems last night to very distinguished audience of congressmen and, and uh, literary people, and he says that you're a fine poet. And he says that he has discovered right here in this hotel a busboy who's working... Uh, as a busboy, but who is also a very good poet. They said, you're discovered, and we want to write about you. So they interviewed me and found out where I went to school and all sorts of things and what kind of poetry I wrote and asked me to give them some of the poetry to publish in the paper. And there appeared in the Washington Star an interview which I believe was syndicated across the country. And my picture holding up a tray of dirty dishes in the middle of the Warden Park dining room was in the paper, and that was my first publicity break. About that time in Washington, there was held a Ku Klux Klan parade. Down Pennsylvania Avenue, the Klan paraded in white robes and hoods, masks, and I saw this parade myself. And I was sort of, well, in a way, moved by it because, of course, the Klan has been the organization that since emancipation had terrorized the Negro people in the South, and it seemed rather odd to me that they should be parading down the streets of our capital. And so it was around that time that I wrote this poem called Ku Klux Klan. The poem itself is about a problem which is still not solved in the South, the problem of the Negro and the right to vote. There are some portions of our country where if you're colored, you practically take your life in your hands when you want to go to the ballot box. Well, in the poem, this young man, young colored man, is telling about what happened to him when he wanted to vote. It goes like this. They took me out to some lonesome place. They said, do you believe in the great white race? 
I said, Mister, to tell you the truth, I'd believe in anything if you just turn me loose. The white man said, Boy, can it be you are standing there assassin me? They hit me in the head and knocked me down. Then they kicked me on the ground. A clansman said, Nigger, look me in the face and tell me you believe in the great white race. Well, of course, that poem was written long before the war, and we fought a war to help rid the world of that sort of racial supremacy theory. Well, I guess the war helped a little bit, but we still haven't quite gotten rid of some of those kinds of ideas in some portions of our country. And maybe the reason the word Mississippi occurs so often in my poems is that to Negroes, Mississippi happens to be one of the states that symbolizes uh, racial bigotry and intolerance and lynching and brutality. Uh, this is a poem called Roland Hayes Beaten, and it happened that the distinguished Negro singer, famous all over the world, uh, chose to go back to his home state, Georgia, and live for a time in Georgia one day in a small town near the plantation which he had purchased. He went in to buy a pair of shoes and happened to sit down on a bench which the clerk said was reserved for white people, that no Negroes should sit on this bench in this shoe shop or shoe store. And uh, apparently Roland Hayes didn't move fast enough and he was attacked by the shoe clerk and beaten. So I wrote this poem, Roland Hayes Beaten, Georgia, 1942. Negroes, sweet and docile, meek, humble and kind, beware the day they change their minds. Wind in the cotton fields, gentle breeze, beware the hour it uproots trees. And this is a poem about a lynching. The poem is called Silhouette. Southern gentle lady, do not swoon. They've just hung a black man in the dark of the moon. They've hung a black man to a roadside tree in the dark of the moon for the world to see how Dixie protects its white womanhood. Southern gentle lady, be good, be good. Song for a Dark Girl. Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. They hung my black young lover to a crossroads tree. Way down south in Dixie, bruised body high in air. I asked the white Lord Jesus, what was the use of prayer? Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. Love is a naked shadow on a gnarled and naked tree. Here are some poems about Negroes who migrated from the south, who come to the big cities of the north looking for better jobs, better schools to educate their children, better places to live. This poem is called One Way Ticket. I pick up my life and take it with me and I put it down in Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo, Scranton, Harlem, any place that is north and east and not Dixie. I pick up my life and take it on the train to Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Seattle, Oakland, Salt Lake, any place that is north and west and not south. I am fed up with Jim Crow laws, people who are cruel and afraid, who lynch and run, who are scared of me and me of them. I pick up my life and take it away on a one-way ticket, gone up north, gone out west, gone. But of course, up north and out west and anywhere that People live, there are problems of one sort or another, but the old problems of 
Jim Crowism and segregation and terror, they're usually left pretty far behind. You don't find the excesses of race prejudice in northern or western cities. And so here is a poem about a girl who is graduating in, let's say, in a town like Chicago. The poem is called Graduation. Cinnamon and rayon, jet and coconut eyes, Mary Lulu Jackson smooths the skirt at her thighs. Mama, portly oven, brings remainders from the kitchen where the people all are icebergs wrapped in checks and wealthy. Diploma in its new frame. Mary Lulu Jackson, eating chicken, tells her mama she's a typist and the clicking of the keys will spell the name of a job in a fine office, far removed from basic oven, cook stoves, and icebergs kitchen. Mama says, praise Jesus, until then I'll bring home chicken. The diploma burst its frame to scatter stardust in their eyes. Mama says, praise Jesus, the colored race will rise. Mama says, praise Jesus. Then, because she's tired, she sighs. Many of my poems have been about the problems of working people trying to get ahead in the world, working people both white and Negro, the problems of trying to educate your children when you don't have very much money. This one is perhaps the best known of my poems in that manner. It's a poem called Mother to Son. It has been set to music a number of times. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I've been a-climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So, boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit on on the steps because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now, for I still going, honey. I still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. I would like to read you a few of the lyric poems that originally appeared in Fields of Wonder. Borderline. I used to wonder about living and dying. I think the difference lies between tears and crying. I used to wonder about here and there. I think the distance is nowhere. Genius Child. This is a song for the genius child. Sing it softly, for the song is wild. Sing it softly as ever you can, lest the song get out of hand. Nobody loves a genius child. Can you love an eagle tame or wild? Wild or tame, can you love a monster of frightening name? Nobody loves a genius child. Kill him and let his soul run wild. And this is almost the shortest poem I ever wrote, a poem called Suicide's Note. The calm, cool face of the river asked me for a kiss. But even shorter than that one is a poem of mine whose title is longer than the poem itself. The title is A Little Lyric of Great Importance. And the poem is, I Wish the Rent Was Heaven Sent. would like to read you one about Bop characters. Um, this one called Motto. I play it cool and dig all jive. That's the reason I stay alive. My motto, as I live and learn, is dig and be dug in return. And then uh, this one called Flatted Fifths, which is very hard to say. Flatted Fifths, F-I-F-T-H-S. Little colored boys with beards, 
Rebop, bebop, mop and stop. Little colored boys with fears, frantic, kick their drafty years into flatted fifths and flatter beers. Flatted fifths, flatter beers that on a sudden change become sparkling oriental wines, rich and strange. Silken bathrobes with gold twines and Heilbrunner Crawford not undreamed of Lewis combines in silver thread and diamond notes on trademarks inside Howard coats. Little colored boys in berets, oop papa da, horse of fantasy of days, oo ya coo, and dig all plays. Bebop boys implore Mecca to achieve six disc with Decca. And in conclusion, I would like to read a few of my poems, two or three poems of hope for the future in relation to the race problem in this country of ours. I might, uh, as a prelude to those poems, read one called Harlem, which happens to be the poem that has given the title to a hit play, A Raisin in the Sun. The title comes from the third line in this poem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Some of my poems are very definitely poems of hope, poems that try to say that I believe that the great ideals of American democracy will certainly eventually be worked out for everybody in our country, everywhere in our country. This is a poem called Democracy. Democracy will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. I have as much right as the other fellow has to stand on my two feet and own the land. I tire so of hearing people say, let things take their course, tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a great need. I live here too. I want freedom just as you. Refugee in America. There are words like freedom, sweet and wonderful to say. On my heartstrings, freedom sings all day, every day. There are words like liberty that almost make me cry. If you had known what I knew, you would know why. And this one called Tomorrow. We have tomorrow bright before us like a flame. Yesterday a night gone thing, a sundown name. And dawn today, broad arch above the road we came. We march, Americans together, we march. And in conclusion, I think perhaps I might read one of the poems that I like best of all my little poems. And for some reason, I, I lean toward short poems. I think, to me, the shorter poems are usually the better. In my opinion, poetry should sort of be the essence of an emotion. If you want to say a great deal about the way you feel about something or describe in detail a situation, then you write a short story or you write a novel. But if you want to compress into just a very few words the very essence of an emotion or a feeling, then you write a poem. This is one of my favorite little poems called No Regrets. Out of love, no regrets, though the goodness be wasted forever. 
Out of love, no regrets, though the return be never. <laughs>